The title of this message is The Greatness of God in the Midst of the Great Tribulation. The subject title, A Biblical Response to Sickness. You've heard preached or maybe said or spoken or even meditated on the words the Great Tribulation many times. But I can tell you, according to the Word of God, according to the truth of Scripture, according to the foretelling of prophecy, that the Lord shall be known among the nations in the midst of the Great Tribulation. The Lord shall be great, greatly feared, greatly troubling all people on the face of the earth, greatly speaking, and greatly magnified, whether by the fierce hatred of rebellious and wicked men, or by the praises of the saints all around the world, singing to God and waiting for His return upon the clouds. The Lord shall be great, in the midst of the great tribulation. And that is something to anticipate. When you look into, as before, the window of time, by the eyes of prophecy, when you look into where we are headed as the people of God and as the Gentile church, considering all the calamities of the tribulation, whether it be pestilence that this world has never seen, whether it be sickness and distress and lack of peace in society, in the world, in the nations, in the government, whether it be the persecution and the hatred and the slander that is presently right now building and growing in every form of expertise that this world knows, it is forming in such a slanted way that soon it shall be turned upon the people of God as an instrument to accuse them and slander them. It's called worldly wisdom. It doesn't matter what expertise or mastery in the world that you're looking at, no, no matter what vocation, it's all building to this one climactic point for the, to receive the Antichrist and to hate, despise the people of the biblical Christ. And that's where we're headed. That's where we're headed even to the point of where we cannot buy or sell in the one world government that is coming. We'll be fugitives. Fugitives. Criminals. Those that are on the run. And it's written in Scripture that God shall give power to the Antichrist to overcome us. And it says, in the midst of it, them that know their God shall do exploits. They shall pass through great tribulation. They shall wash their robes and make them white in the blood of the Lamb. And they shall overcome by the word of their testimony and by the blood of the Lamb. Something very amazing to me, brethren, and it is the coming glory and greatness of God that shall happen in the world. As much as I look into this window of time of what is foretold to come upon the world and the agony and the distress and the darkness and the blackness, the pain, brethren, the misery, when men's hearts shall fail for looking upon the things that are coming upon the earth. Men's hearts are literally having heart attacks as they're distressed and in anguish over all of the tribulation that God is bringing the entire world into. When I consider these things, this, this manifestation of God's anger to chastise all populations and all nations of the world, and then also at the same time considering that the Gentile church shall reach and successfully evangelize 
and find converts in every nation and tribe and tongue in the entire world, even the unreached populations. When I consider this, this twofold purpose of God in the end times, it causes me to reconcile myself to the eternal purposes of God and His glory. The eternal purposes of God. That means that from eternity past and in on to eternity in the future, there are eternal purposes that are unchanging in God. Unchanging purpose. Eternal purposes. Purposes that He will never change His mind about. You can find these purposes in Romans chapter 9. As it describes the future of every single human being on earth that has ever lived, that is dead now, that is whose spirits are with God or whose spirits are in hell. Everyone who's ever lived falls into two categories and they are the elect unto salvation and the elect unto damnation. And Romans chapter 9 is a chapter that's dedicated to expound the, this doctrine more than any other chapter in Scripture. Being elected by God before you were born, not based upon the things that you've done, to be chosen by God in election, in His own choice, that you'll be saved. Or you'll be damned. But not just that. It's not just a mere choice that is emotionally neutral. This process of election as God the Father before His creation, as a creator before creation, or as the potter before the clay, and He gathers all the vessels of humanity before Him, And he looks upon one vessel of clay and he says, it's an elect for salvation. He looks upon another vessel of clay and he says, it's elect for damnation. It's not a morally neutral, random choosing. Where he's looking upon the vast multitudes of humanity that shall be created from eternity past in his own mind and heart, looking upon them without any hindrance or limitation, being able to behold them right now, though they're not created. And he looks upon one and he says, damnation. He looks upon another and he says, salvation. According to Romans chapter 9, it's not just damnation and salvation, but it's, I will be glorified in the power and intensity by which I will destroy this man on earth and in the afterlife. And to the other, I will be glorified in the power and in the magnitude and the unsearchableness of my love and undeserved mercy by which I will show upon this individual in this life and in the afterlife. It's the glory and power of His anger to punish and make miserable those who are justly doomed. And it's to have mercy and redeem and lift up the head and raise up from the dunghill and clothe and royalty and salvation and unspeakable glory. Those that don't deserve salvation. It's the power of His wrath displayed. And it's the riches of His mercy unveiled. But what is amazing, brethren, what is astonishing is that these two choices and two eternal purposes to display the glory of God, one, the glory of damnation, one, the glory of salvation, these are not emotionless decisions of God. These are not a random choosing. It's not some casino lot that you're just spinning and it just falls where it falls. The inspired scripture, the God-breathed instruction that God gives to humanity is that God loves the vessels of salvation from eternity past into eternity future. And God hates the vessels of damnation from eternity past into eternity future.
that there is an emotional motivation behind election. And to those that are elected damnation, it's hatred. And those that are elected salvation, it's love. And thus we can understand that not only was election determined from eternity past, not only is election this, this unchanging, unstoppable, sovereign decision of God ruling over all the events of the world, not only is this real, this ultimate sovereignty of God, but this love of God and this hatred of God is what is ruling And thus he says, Jacob I loved, and Esau I hated. And I think about this love of God, brethren. And I think about what is going to happen with elect vessels of mercy in the midst of the great tribulation. How God shall have mercy, brethren. Not only mercy in in blood atonement, or mercy to grant faith in the articles by which we know and understand the gospel that happened approximately 2,000 years ago. Not merely that, but such a fullness of faith in the gospel and a fullness of faith in Jesus Christ by Jesus Christ Himself unveiling His face to His church so that they are captivated and exercised by the power that comes from His face, so that they will be more faithful and obedient and trustworthy and worthy expressions of Jesus Christ in the midst of the blackest and darkest generation that's ever existed. That there's coming a great darkness on the world, and there's coming a great light shining in the midst of it. And it's these two purposes of God coming into manifestation like never before in one single generation. The anger of God and the justice of God and the chastisements of God and the damnation of God. And right there in the symphony of time displayed before the world, right before the second return of Jesus Christ, the bodily presentation of God Himself before the whole world. It's never happened before. The hatred of God will be there, setting the stage. And that day, Jesus Christ's church will look like a faithful, pure, virgin, sincere hearted bride waiting for the return. Of her bridegroom. In one generation, this love of God and hatred of God are going to meet and manifest, collide, and all of humanity is brought in to these two purposes of God's glory in one generation. I consider the Scriptures, brethren, I meditate upon the promises of God. I loathe and mourn over my own sin that hinders me from believing on Christ. Every hour I spend in prayer, every time I come near to the presence of the living Lord Jesus Christ, who is my salvation, I find holy reflections and meditations in my soul, wondering in my heart, if only, if I, if only I could believe more in Christ. If only I could be more childlike. If only I could be more humble before His presence. If only I could just trust in His Word with all of my heart without any doubting. Without any uncertainty. If only I had more wisdom to resist the gainsayings of the devil and the fiery darts of the wicked one. If only I believed in God as God enabled the first century apostles and Christians to believe in God and to believe in Christ. Though they did it when they first met the Lord Jesus in bodily presence. They didn't believe in Him. 
He told them even that you will not believe. You will not believe until you see the signs and wonders and the angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. He even said, I believe it's in John 16, he says, now do you believe? Right towards the end of his ministry. They walked on with trembling knees and doubtful hearts and feeble minds and even offended hearts at times at how narrow the way was and how fiercely he denounced the Pharisees and how so few confessed his name and all these other assorted ideas that they didn't understand the personality of God manifest in sinless perfection. And I can identify with that. I can identify heretofore this road, this pathway that I see the apostles took to be a disciple of the Lord, a learner of the Lord, to be progressively sanctified and progressively attain greater and greater repentances of known sin in my life and greater and greater expressions of faith in in Christ and in God and fidelity to Christ in my life over the years. And I think about in my heart how the living Lord Jesus, after He raised from the grave, after they all denied Him in the night of His agony and, and his, in the night of His betrayal, and they all forsook Him and betrayed Him and denied Him and were ashamed of Him, and they deserved damnation twofold, threefold, tenfold more than any other sinner on earth. Because they knew Christ and forsook Christ. Because they saw so many miracles done by the living Lord Jesus Christ that all the books in the world could not contain every story that could be told. Because they were more blessed and more honored and more privileged to see the things that their eyes see that every prophet of every past generation, every priest of every past generation longed to live in that generation. To see what their eyes see and to hear what their ears hear and to be nestled into the bosom of God incarnate in Jesus of Nazareth. Truly, it must have been an amazing thing, brother. An amazing thing that the image of the invisible God, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, manifest among men and they were able to nestle themselves in His bosom as the Apostle John did, reclining at the table. And they forsook Him, brethren. They denied Him. They couldn't even stay awake when they saw Him weeping and sweating in agony in the garden in the middle of the night. They didn't even care about Him that much. They were probably confused, tempted, And they were sinning. He said, pray, lest ye enter into temptation. They were sinning. And I think about the mercy of God that Jesus Christ had on them. That in a matter of three days when He rose from the grave, and He appeared unto them for a space of forty days and forty nights, And He showed them and spoke to them of the mysteries of the glory of the kingdom of God for 40 days and 40 nights. He communed with them in His glorified body that can walk through walls. He displayed before them His victory over the grave and over hell as one who was the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and who had the keys of death and hell in His hands. Standing there in bodily form with the scars still on his body, in his hands and on his side. It says he was marred beyond recognition. And he was standing there before them. Alive from the dead. Still, even now, the right hand of God the Father in the very same body. He was standing as a beacon of redemption to the fallen sons of Adam. He was the second Adam, the quickening spirit. He was not the Adam who fell, but he is the son of Adam who rises. And with the first Adam's fall, we all fell. 
with the second Adam's rise, we also rise. Those who are born in Him. He was standing there not as a demonstration by inheritance what all men shall experience in spiritual death, the fall of the first Adam. But He was standing there presenting His body as that by inheritance from Him we shall all be like Him. And where He is going, we will go. And whatever He is going to do, we're going to do. And thus He is the anchor for us in heaven. The first human being to walk with His human footsteps across the sanctuary of the heavenly scenery in the holy temple which God had built to present Himself as the very first human priest standing in heaven in an eternal priesthood at the order of Melchizedek on behalf of mankind. What it would have been like, brethren, to have a conversation with Jesus Christ in that 40-day period, I cannot fathom. What would happen to my soul if I could commune with the resurrected and glorified Lord Jesus, who I just betrayed and forsook, and as He touches me, embraces me as a father to a son, all the stinking wounds of my sin are healed and bound up and mollified. Brethren, in that day when doubting Thomas said, My Lord and my God, when their eyes beheld their beloved, God was depositing into their souls a measure of grace and faith that mankind simply cannot attain except by the appearance of the glory of God. Men, sinful men, simply cannot walk with God like God was calling them to walk with God except by the appearance of His glory and grace in Christ. You can try, you will fail. I can try and I will fail. Except God in His glorious, unmerited, undeserved acceptance, despite our betrayal, backsliding, stubbornness, and stiff-neckedness, He would come and condescend and embrace us and gather us together as jewels for His crown and as chicklets under His wings. And as a mighty eagle fluttering over us with his mighty strength, we simply do not have any ability to walk with the living God except he comes in like manner. And as I meditate on these things, I think within my heart, there is absolutely nothing I can do. There is no argument. I can give before the throne of God to be such a privileged man that God in heaven would look down upon the pitch blackness of of declension and backsliding for these past 2,000 years and choose the century, the 21st century in which I live to come and restore His glory and hasten the coming of the Antichrist and end the age with the manifestation of His mighty power and glory and strength. There's absolutely nothing I can do. This is above me. This is so far above us. This scheme of redemption and damnation is so far higher than us that we can only look at it and look up with our eyes and gaze upon it from afar off and prophetically view it and see it and handle it in the sense of gazing upon it as if it's in our very hands. And then moments later it vanishes away because of our unbelief. 
The things that we see in the spirit of prophecy and by faith and by childlikeness as we read the Word of God and are exercised by the power and grace of the Holy Ghost in salvation that we have and enjoy right now. When we behold these glories, they vanish away because of our unbelief, because of our sin and our carnality and our pride and our self-consciousness and the strife envy and sin in our members that grieves the living God. And when I consider, brethren, the love of God coming from eternity past, like a cavalry of a million horses Rumbling the heavens, this unstoppable force of power and energy and love and holy desire that God has to glorify His name. This unstoppable force of God's love that's coming from eternity past and that shall appear in a generation. And I think about this this grace and this love upon vessels of mercy that He shall display so that in the ages to come they might see and behold the glorious riches of His mercy that He has and the grace that He has upon saved individuals and that it's one day going to come down and seize Christians, lay hold upon them with unstoppable and irresistible grace and reveal to them the virtue of His covenant so that they Unlike their fathers in the previous generations, would be a spotless bride for his return and do mighty exploits before the Nebuchadnezzar of Nebuchadnezzars who's about to step foot upon the scene. Brethren, to view the the inevitability of His glory in this twofold eternal purpose and myself and my sin and the knowledge of God that I desire and the humility that I desire and the faith that I desire and I present myself to God with the spots upon my, my robe and with all the filthiness that I have and I present myself to God the Father there is nothing I can argue before His throne. There is no argument I can give to Him except I begin to confess and extol the eternal purposes of God to redeem humanity and the rushing forces of this unstoppable love which will one day seize Christians and lay hold upon them and make them polished shafts in His quiver and make them the weapons of His righteousness to zealously traverse all the world for His own glory. And I just stand there admiring His name and admiring who He is and admiring His eternal purpose and confessing them and reminding Him of them. The beautification of Jerusalem and the spotlessness of His bride in the midst of the ages as they decline into depravity. And we can there gaze upon it as watchmen upon the wall the beauty of Jerusalem which shall one day be. And there's nothing else that we can say or dare say except praising the gloriousness of His grace which is potential and possible in Him and which is administered and granted by a sovereign design. Romans 9 describes the course of these two vessels. Verse 20 Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? 
Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another vessel unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show His wrath, a willingness to show His wrath, a desire to reveal, display His anger, and to make His power, namely the power of His anger, and the the intensity by which He punishes sin, to make His power known, endured with much long-suffering the vessels of wrath, fitted, formed to destruction. In the next purpose, and that he might make known, as John 17, the high priestly prayer declared that all the world might know that the love wherewith God loved Christ is upon the church in one generation. The world cannot deny it. He wasn't exaggerating. It was not a poem. It was not a dark saying. When he said in John chapter 17 that we would be perfected in one, he said, the glory that thou hast given to me, I have given to them. And he said that the world may know. The world may be conscious of this. The world may be aware of this. The world might be confronted by this. The world might be forced to realize this and forced to confess this in the secret chambers of their heart. The world will know that God the Father sent Jesus Christ and loves the church as He loved Jesus. Even as Christ was standing there at Moses' seat, reading from the law, and every heart in the synagogue was wondering at the gracious words that were coming from His lips, brethren, there's coming a time, there's coming a generation when all the hearts of men shall wonder and shall admire and shall think upon and meditate upon the unstoppable conviction and the confrontation that is happening to them by the divine power of God. Wondering at who, looking upon who, who is the gazing stock, who is this wonder, and it's the bride of Christ, it's the church of God, and they're looking, and they're saying, they're thinking in their heart, in the depths of their soul, God the Father sent Jesus, and these are His people, and He loves them. His unmerited redemptive grace has seized them, and He loves them. Even as he loved Christ. Though they would not confess it with their mouth. Because their lives. In the depths of their soul. They will know. They will know. The world will know. Brethren, this is what Romans 9, 23 is talking about. And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had afore prepared unto glory. The riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy. That means... The richest brethren, the the innumerable and invaluable, vast riches, the vast glory of God, immeasurable, innumerable, invaluable, expanding beyond comprehension. God is going to glorify Himself by clothing Christians with His glory. And the riches of His glory no man can number, no man can value, no man can comprehend. The vast expanding essence of what His love is, no man can search out. You can go the breadth of it, the height of it, the length of it, the depth of it. You'll never know the distance of it. You'll never know the volume of it. It passes knowledge. The riches of His glory on vessels of mercy. For all the world is conscious that this is the work of the mercy of God. 
that these are sinners. That they don't deserve this. They deserve justice. They deserve death. They deserve to die. They deserve evil. They deserve punishment and plague. And they're saying, this is mercy. God has had mercy. And the world knows it. The world knows it. The world sees the glory of God as it rested upon God incarnate, glorifying the name of Jesus and the life of Jesus in His body, the bride of Christ. In such an effectual, convincing way that the world in their own heart cannot deny it, though they go to hell like Cain. Men don't sin and go to hell. It's not because they don't know God exists or that God is good or that God is righteous or that He's powerful and eternal and glorious. Men go to hell because they love sin and they hate God. They're not victims of lack of knowledge and they're not victims of atheism. They're not victims of just never knowing and never seeing. Romans 1 says every sinner has both known him and rejected him at the age of the knowledge of good and evil. And in this final age, brethren, as the plagues of God are going to chastise humanity with such intense suffering and tribulation and torment, all the world, it says, is going to blaspheme God, though they know it comes from him. And in that day, the bride of Christ shall be beautified in the garments of Zion, and the world will know that God the Father sent his Son And loves them. Loves Christians. Even as he loved Jesus. And these Christians are going to torment the world. It's going to be a torment to them to see this. It's going to be like smelling sulfur smoke. Piercing the senses of your nose. And of your your smelling faculties. Just agonizing your mind with this brutal smell, this brutal stinking savor, which is the knowledge of God to sinners, which is death. As the Apostle Paul said, thanks be to God who doth always lead us in triumph, manifesting the savor of His knowledge by us in every place, to the one, the savor of life and the life, and to the other, the savor of death and the death. The knowledge of God beheld, embraced, inhaled by living souls is either life or death if you're saved and you're lost. You either come to the fact that you're separated from God, that you're under His wrath, that you're going to die, you're spiritually dead, and you're headed for the second death, and only in Him is life, and you're alienated from Him and you hate Him. Or you're an elect vessel of mercy, And when you hear of God, know God, hear His Word and perceive His presence, you perceive that in Him is life, and His life is in His Son, and His Son is in you, and you have a hope of glory in the midst of the world, wasting away in corruption, being subject to corruption, and groaning and travailing in agony until the redemption and the liberty of the sons of God coming upon the world. And you find hope in life, and everything you hear about Christ It's life to you. Glory to glory, life to life, grace to grace. Brethren, this is the glory that's spoken of in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. The Apostle Paul is bold to say, That when we were dead in sins, verse 5, He hath quickened, He hath made us alive together with Christ by grace. should pause and wonder at that. There is no person who is beyond the boundaries and the confinements of grace. There is no one excluded From the power of grace. There is nothing you can do. If this grace 
seizes you, you will become whatever the favor of God has determined for you. It says, by grace are ye saved, by irresistible, undeserved favor, by everlasting love. By grace are ye saved through faith, believing in this. Believing in the person, the message, the work of grace. Of God pardoning sin, forgiving sin, cleansing sin, empowering men to overcome sin. Not by our own works righteousness, which we have done, nor could do, nor would do. Because in us dwells no good thing. He hath made us alive together, not separate, not alienated, together, bound together in this eternal, just loftiness of His Son, soaring into the heavens as the second Adam. We have been made alive together with Him. By grace are ye saved. Past tense, present tense, future tense. By grace are ye saved. And hath raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. For what purpose? Being fixed together and joined positionally in the most privileged and hallowed position in all of the material and immaterial universe. The throne of God Himself. There you are. Everyone in heaven wants to be near the throne, wants to look upon Christ and God who is at the throne and upon the throne. All of heaven and all of the material and immaterial universe revolves around the throne. And positionally and legally, you are there. Because your brother is there. His name is Jesus of Nazareth. And all the sons of David sat at the table of David and ate of his meat. So what Christ is inheriting, you inherit. And you're his brother and you eat what he eats. You'll sit where he sits. He hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. For what purpose, brethren? This, this unutterable, inconceivable, incomprehensible grace, this, this unimaginable position whereby, whereby we've been placed at the very throne of God legally. And all the angels of heaven admiring it, and the seraphims and cherubims covering their eyes and flying, circling about the throne, crying probably in the Hebrew language or in some angelic language, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord God of hosts. And there you are, for what purpose? It's not that you might be caught up together in heaven, and no earth-dwelling sinner knows about it. It's not so that you'll be caught up to heaven, so that no devil on earth trembles about it. It's not so that you can be caught up to heaven, so that nobody on earth, and no, no evil, and no demise, and no penalty, and no suffering, and no wickedness, and no entity on earth, even and creature on earth knows about it. But brethren, it's the contrary. The Bible says the earth, the soil, the sea, the birds, the, the, the sea creatures, the mammals, every living creature groans and travails and waits. Romans chapter 8 says, For the unveiling of the adoption of God the Father to His sons and daughters through the blood of Christ, the redemption of our body and the liberty of the sons of God being made manifest. And brethren, if all the material universe waits and quakes and ails to see it and groans and travails, the inanimate material universe, brethren, you can be sure that the devils tremble about it, the holy angels
angels are amazed over it. All living entities in heaven, under the earth, around the humanity as an invisible being or some kind of fallen angelic being, they are all amazed at it. And do you think God the Father through His Son Jesus Christ has accomplished all of this so that sinners shall not be convinced of this, shall not be amazed at this, and shall not know it in the depths of their soul with convincing power? Shall and He will, brother. They will know. We are caught up together with Christ in this position. Christ said in the Gospel of John, it is better that I go away because I go to the Father and He is greater than I. And if you're legally and positionally by grace positioned where He has gone and you can legally assert the benefits and privileges and the riches of His inheritance while on earth, and tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and in His name do mighty signs and wonders, and in His name have power over sin, and utterance to preach, and priestly prayerfulness in success, in every other facet of Christianity. Whether in ministering, doing it with the ability that God supplies, whether it's speaking, speaking the oracles of God, whether anything, whatsoever you do in a word and deed, doing all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, whatever it is, It is so that, verse 7, in the ages to come, every age, but how much more the age, the end of the Gentile church age, exceedingly, abundantly, beyond we could ask or think, certainly in the millennial age, in the millennial reign, but brethren, at the close of the Gentile church age, He might show the exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness Toward us through Christ. Toward you, brethren. Toward us. It's not the arrows of God's anger. It's not the weapons of His indignation that are pointed towards you. It's not the scowl and fury of lion-like rage which is gazing upon you. But He says here, the exceeding riches, exceeding your thoughts, exceeding numbers, exceeding comprehension, exceeding knowledge, the exceeding riches, beyond human capacity, beyond angelic capacity, beyond every comprehension, the exceeding riches of His undeserved favor and undeserved acceptance and of His empowerment of the weak, His grace in His kindness toward us. Toward us. The entire bounty of the inheritance of our royal king. And all of his dignity and his eternal worthiness. And his riches and honor and fame and glory. His eyes are upon you. Behind him is the engine and mechanism of an eternal kingdom. And he's here to save you. And in all of his dignity and unapproachable glory... And all of His brilliance and His piercing holiness by which you would fall dead down at His presence prostrate if you saw Him in His glory. He says, lives to show you kindness. 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 Kindness like a mother tenderly comforts a child. Kindness like a hen opens up the crevice of her wings as the sun is setting so the chicklets leap upon her breast and dip their heads into the crevice and crawl in for comfort and warmth 
and shelter for the night. Kindness. That's, it's inevitable in your own conscience before the living God. The Spirit of Jesus Christ is going to minister to your soul. Kindness. In all of His authority and glory and loftiness and unapproachable and terror and fear. Yet there is this nearness, tenderness, brotherliness, touchableness of His kindness. And this is the secret of abiding in the Lord. It's childlike reception of His kindness as you walk with trembling before His authority and holiness and terror. And in all of the doctrines of His terror and fear and reverence, it shall only teach your soul to cherish and more uh, of a more wealthy portion embrace His kindness. A wealthier portion, a greater lot, a more assertive placement at the king's table to take the portion of a prince. All of his terror, all of his fear, all of his holiness, all of his punishments come upon those who are not convinced. Surrendered, admiring, worshipping in awe and wonder the glory of His riches and His mercy and His kindness towards His sons and daughters. Because without that we can do nothing. We can do absolutely nothing. As much as you try to obey the commandments of God in so much that you're trying to earn the love of God, you will fail. The arm of your flesh will wither. Your strength and your hope will faint. And only then when you're stripped of self-righteousness and you're stripped of your own moral fortitude and you're stripped of your own abilities and you're stripped of your own pride, you look unto the Lamb of God, you'll have power. And obedience will rise up inside of your earthen vessel like an undying spring whose waters never cease to flow. You strive and you strive and you strive to obey the commandments of God, to obey the law of God, that you might be pleasing to God the Father and somewhat just be, be, be nourished in the thought that He loves you, brethren. But unless we first receive the love of God by faith in His grace, we shall never Obey the commandments of God. You must first receive the love of God and by the undeserved empowerment of the love of God can we then obey the commandments of God. Never can that be reversed. And in all of the exercises of your conscience, to behold the fear of God and the deep conviction of sin that God wants to make you hate it by showing you His angry countenance, you can be bolstered up in fortitude in the midst of that chastisement, in the midst of the valley, in the midst of the darkness, because it's a design of His grace. And what He has promised to perform in you, He shall be faithful to do it inasmuch as you don't call Him wickedly in your own heart a liar. Brethren, in the last days, As tribulation is coming upon the world. And everything shall be shaken. The word of God says that one thing will remain unshaken. And it's the kingdom of God. And the glory of God and specifically the love and the tenderness and the kindness and the mercy of God. 
clothes the flowers of the field with a glory greater than Solomon. And he feeds the birds of the air, though they are such little value, humanly speaking. How much more and abundantly does he have love and value for human beings? Much more than cattle, much more than flowers. And he says, seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness. For all these things shall be added unto you. Knowing that in God's angry countenance, He is squelching and burning away the beauty of the flower. Knowing that in God's sovereign design in the great tribulation, He's going to tear the very fabric of the sky and make it roll back as a scroll He's going to disrupt and frustrate the very axis of the earth and make it reel to and fro like a drunken man. He's going to cause the very stars that He's fixed by His eternal powers to fall down, crashing upon the earth with explosive force stronger than nuclear weapons. He's going to rend and trouble and cause quaking and eruption and clouds of darkness and distress and famines and earthquakes and storms and hurricanes and waves, drowning waters, burning fires, rending winds. And as pestilence and despair and sorrow are covering the land like a thick blanket, in that day there shall be a company of them that fear Him, that are standing unshakably in His kingdom because they know All of it is under His sovereign design for His glorious purpose of His grace. And the world is coming to a glorious end. Because they have sought first His kingdom and His righteousness. And they understand its beginning and its present continuous power and authority and unshakable. And they understand the design of its end and its appearing and its, 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 its display before the world. They understand what God is doing. The message behind the miracles. The message is behind the plagues. And thus they are there opening their mouth wide that God might fill it. That honey might come forth from the rocks. And that a candle might be lit over their head in the midst of black darkness. They have sought first His kingdom and His righteousness. Wherefore, receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Hebrews 12, 28-29. Receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Brethren, preceding that time, God is going to design a disciplinary course, a tutoring school for His people to prepare them to engage the tribulations which will be great in that hour. He's going to, I'm going to repeat that, he's going to take us through a course of tutoring, of humbling, what Deuteronomy chapter 8 calls chastisement, to humble our hearts and to teach us to trust in him. Just as he did with David, David in the midst of his loneliness on the wilderness plains with the sheep, there he is, counting their numbers, knowing them by name, tending to their needs, following the sheep, leading them to green pastures, and it's communing with the Spirit of God, communing with the presence of God, inquiring whereby he might have grace to be a king after God's own heart. Ever since Samuel anointed him, and the Spirit of God came upon him from that day forward. And there, one day, as the usual ordinary patter came in, his meditations were probably on the the grace and the glory of this calling whereby he shall assert the throne of Israel 
and lead the people of God as sheep. And he as their shepherd is just meditating upon all these promises. And he's in some sense, in some real sense, he feels clothed with immortality that he cannot die until his work is done, as George Whitfield said. He cannot die until the word of God is fulfilled. It doesn't matter if I raise up this knife and slay Isaac and he's dead and blood is shed all over the place that God will raise the man from the dead. Because his word cannot fail. His promises cannot fail. David is meditating upon these purposes, the promises of God and the privilege and the honor and the the unstoppableness of them that they are driven and fueled by the engine of grace which, which is undying, which is powerful, which seized them at the beginning, which will bring them onward because faithful is he that began a good work in you. He shall be faithful to complete it. And as much as you hear the voice of the command of God coming to your soul from the corridors of heaven down in the chamber of your heart, you can know from whence that voice came, he shall bring you, he shall perform the call. Because faithful is he that calls you and he shall also do it. He's meditating. He's meditating and, and, and highly exalting the rock of his salvation. And, and the beginning and end, the outcome and the omega of what Jesus Christ is as a Savior. And there suddenly coming upon him, without any premeditative thought, a lion leaps upon one of the sheep of the pasture, grabs it in its, its fierce claws, puts the, 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 his mouth just gaping over the sheep, and David runs and leaps and moves through the midst of the sheep and comes towards the lion. He doesn't even know what he's doing. He doesn't even know why he's doing what he's doing. And he's coming and he has no staff. He has no weapon. They were laying down on the other side and he's running towards the lion and he grabs it by the beard, a male lion, and he smites it with his bare hand. In one strike he's dead. And after it was all said and done, he came to himself as if he was in some kind of trance, as if he was in some kind of dream estate, and he realized he just smote a lion with his own bare hand. And he said, only God could have done this. Only God. Not by sword or by spear, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. He said the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God seized him. And he began to meditate upon all the typological representations of a lion coming upon the sheep of Israel when he's one day king and thinking about the trustworthiness of God and how he may be the king of Israel, but God is the true king of Israel, seated upon the ark in the midst of the cherubim. And he's wondering at the instrumentality of his grace channels only blessed master but with all thy wondrous power and then one day upon the course of his sanctification he encounters the same thing but with a bear and the same exact thing happens all the way leading up to the day without any premeditated thought being sent by his earthly father Jesse to go give sustenance to his brothers who are at war. He finds himself among the cowering soldiers of a backslidden Israel. And with the voice of a giant blaspheming, cursing in the name of false gods. And his very first thought in the Holy Ghost is who is this uncircumcised Philistine who taunts the armies of the living God? His very first thought and impulse is the very same courageous, unmerited grace that was working inside of his soul to perform the purpose of God's glory. And he finds his mind emanated in holy indignation against this condemned, uncircumcised, without covenant, without God individual, cursing the living God. And he says to King Saul, let no man's heart fail him for this man. I shall go out to battle against him. He disdains the armor of Saul. He disdains it and demoralizes it. And then he runs to the very face of this giant in 
and says he's going to feed him to the birds of the air. He's going to feed his flesh to the fowls of the air. And that you shall know and all the world shall know that there's a God in Israel. And that he saves not by sword or by spear, but by his spirit. A little ruddy, skinny, teenager looking fellow who no, no one with a reasonable mind would put him in armor and put him on the battlefield. Anybody with a reasonable mind would think it's just pure, sick, evil, naughty pride that he's even out here. Wherefore, receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, brethren, he came to be humbled and bowed down in wonder and awe at the amazing grace of God for him, toward him, kindness towards him. You see how God tutored him, God taught him, he took him through a school before he faced Goliath. Thus God will do to us. Psalm 73 says, speaking in context, that the righteous are plagued all the day long. That the eyes of the wicked stand out with fatness, but the righteous are plagued all the day long. 98% of the population falls sick with the disease of chicken pox. But brethren, Psalm 73 says, the wicked have no bands in their death, that their pride is worn like a chain around their neck, in the very fact that they're strong, that their strength is firm, that they're not plagued like other men. But the righteous are. They are plagued. They are chastised. This beloved man, King David, by anointing, was driven out of the kingdom and pursued like a ruthless criminal for over a decade. And he lived in caves and in holes. His, his royalty was with the, the serpents and the, the poisonous scorpions and creatures of the wilderness. His sleep, sleep was troubled in the night by the chilling winds of the wilderness and by the loneliness of the battlefield and dreams of fellow comrades falling down dead by his side. He said the chariot wheel ran over our heads in the Psalms. Thou hast caused the chariot wheel to run over our heads and caused you have caused us to walk through the water and through the fire. He was not treated like other men. This man was chosen of God in a furnace of affliction to be purified, brethren. Purified so that in the midst of his weakness, in every worldly concept, his pitifulness, he would find that the power of God is perfected in weakness and he would learn to glory in his infirmities that God might have glory in his grace in his life, not as his own strength and the pride of his flesh. To be perfected in weakness that God's glory might be perfected in its display of power. Brethren, there's a great tribulation coming upon the world and the Christians are going to drink up the cup first. They're going to be plagued the whole way with suffering, tribulation, and they're going to be ready to trust in God in the midst of a tempest this world is not preparing for. Job 33, 14-33 speaks of sicknesses and the pains of it that men's bones 
ache with pain as they lie upon their bed and they're brought to the very gates of death until they confess to God that I have sinned and I have not done that which is right in thy sight and God has mercy and raises them up from the bars of death from gaping in behind the bars to the very, the very annals of torture and pain. And he says there in Job 33, the Lord works these things oftentimes with man. That's general chastisement. That's chicken pox. That's all these other things. But there is a special chastisement towards Christians. A special humbling that Deuteronomy 8 speaks of. A special judging of the house of God. A chastisement that teaches us to learn His law. That before we were afflicted, we went astray. But now have I learned Thy law. A chastisement that prepares us to be situated in heart and in mind and the unshakableness of God's kingdom through His grace. Psalm 94 verse 12 and 119.67 and 119.71 speaks of this chastisement and it's beyond a general chastisement, a common exercise of man. It's a focused, very designed, calculated chastisement upon saints. 1 Corinthians 11.32 says we are judged, we are chastised, sickness, even death, watching people die, that we might not be condemned with the world. That we might not be condemned with the world. In the midst of it all, brethren, the Lord desires to teach us that though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that we would fear no evil. For God is with us. A story that exemplifies this in extra biblical history that I feel led to close this message with is a testimony from beloved brother Charles Spurgeon, who I believe is in glory right now, who was forsaken by Christianity that once adored him, and who was an offscoring and a contempt and a byword among his very own college that he started, and who died the death that his wife and others who were close to him said it was by sorrow and by rejection. The same man who said that God's grace was with him more when he finally learned to come out from among them and be separate than it ever was before. He didn't choose that course willingly. He was compelled by the heathen because God loved him. God loved him. During his days, specifically during the time when his ministry first started, the bubonic plague was breaking out. Brother Charles Spurgeon, very young, youthful, found himself in a pulpit and with a church. And this bubonic plague was ravaging people ravaging people. And he spoke about attending a funeral every single day. He laments and speaks about the pain and sorrow of his weeping. He felt as if he wept anymore, he would die. Sometimes feeling that he could not go another day. He was not like these other hirelings who wouldn't visit the sick, but this deadly bubonic plague, brethren, he would visit them all. He said he would be getting calls, and they, everyone wants them to come and visit the bedside of the bubonic plague. And he said he would go. And he visited them. He ministered to them. He did what a true under-shepherd of Jesus Christ should always do in the face of the fangs of wolves surrounding the flock. You look at him straight on. 
And you stay beside that sheep to the very end. That's what He did. He was there at the gates of death with those saints that God by a sovereign design just placed in his in the pews of his church that he might preach the unsearchable riches of God's grace. He raised him up from this wilderness, this small town in the countryside, and the spirit of God just fell upon him and he just found himself preaching to people everywhere he went. And eventually he found himself in a pulpit in the big city, not knowing how he got there nor whither he's going, but that the wind of God's ungovernable power just drove him there. He writes a testimony about what he experienced as the bubonic plague was was everywhere. He was visiting people daily. And he said that as after he was done visiting people day after day, he said he would often feel that he's getting sick. And he would wonder with deep searchings in his heart, am I getting the plague? Am I getting the sickness? Not knowing whether God shall preserve him or whether by a plague he should die. Even as the prophet Elisha, who had a double portion of Elijah's spirit, died by sickness. Died by sickness. You can find that in 2 Kings 12, 14. Or as Epaphroditus in Philippians 2, 24 through 30, who was sick and nigh unto death. And all he could think about was, was the Christians, the Philippians, who heard that he was sick and they couldn't just like call him and find out, Epaphroditus, are you okay? Are you going to die? They're hearing him by letters and they're all distressed. And all Epaphroditus can think about is he wants them to be perfect in the faith. And he's praying for them and he's zealous for them. And he's just so sorrowful that they heard that he was sick because he doesn't want them to be distressed for his sake. <laughs> Praise God. Epaphroditus. He was sick and nigh unto death, brethren. A saint of God. And Charles Spurgeon is wondering in his mind, what is my lot? What is God designing for me? And one day as he was coming back, just nigh of collapsing with sorrow and exhaustion and trembling bitterness of belly and bitterness of soul he's, he's just walking back down the street back to where he lived uh, and transportation there too and he looks over at this window of a commercial building and this, this paper was positioned there and wafered as a sign and in big bold letters written by a marker It was Psalm 91, verse 6. And as he looked upon the paper, and he read the writing, and it says, Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence, verse 6, that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. That a thousand shall fall at thy side, ten thousand at thy right hand, and it shall not come nigh thee. And he found his eyes beholding this, just chancing upon this oracle of God fixed by the power of God. And he says, faith rose in his heart and made the promise his. And from that day forward, he didn't have fear. All of his sorrows were 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 assuaged, he had peace, he had zeal, he had energy, and he had faith that the plague would not come nigh him. And he went on in his ministry, brethren, visiting the patients of bubonic plague and guiding them across Jordan. He writes a commentary about this. He speaks of the pestilence that walketh in darkness. He expounds the mysteries of this language. The pestilence that walketh in darkness. Light in the scripture 
is associated with the knowledge of God. Darkness in scripture is associated with deceptions and delusions. It's not that you have no thoughts. It's that your thoughts are deceiving you. Your thoughts are, are, are lies. Your knowledge is wrong. And you don't know the way. You can't find the way. But the knowledge of God, it's the right way. You're conscientious of the right way. The right path. The right steps to take. But this is the pestilence. The pestilence that walks like a man, like a murderer in the darkness. That you don't know where it's going, who it's hunting, who it will seize, how to stop it, or what are the motions of it. God ordains pestilences to walk in darkness. So that they are not found by man, observed by man, discovered by man, or understood by man. They are pestilences that walk in darkness to haunt and terrorize humankind so that they would turn to God and live. Pestilences that walk in darkness. And that's what the bubonic plague was like. It was walking in darkness. It's like a murderer in the night, a backstabber in a dark alley. And no man knew if it should befall them. And no man knew the cure. It was a pestilence that you could not understand and you could not stop. Only faith in God gave him peace. Only that eternal decree as God burns the chariot with fire and cuts the spear in sunder, and as the mountains fall into the depths of the sea, the Christians, the children of God, are taught to know one truth. Be still and know that I am God, and I will be exalted among the heathen. Psalm 46. Be still in the midst of murderous pestilences, in the midst of laughing and sneering hyenas and wolves that can break your bones by their jaws, rend your flesh with their fangs. In the midst of a hunting, unstoppable work of evil and death, the pestilence that walks in darkness, God says, be still and know in the light, conscientiously, that He is God and He will be exalted among the heathen. Spurgeon writes, The pestilence that walketh in darkness, it is shrouded in mystery as to its cause and cure. It marches on, unseen of men, slaying with hidden weapons like an enemy stabbing in the dark. Yet those who dwell in God are not afraid of it. Nothing is more alarming than the assassin's plot, for he may at any moment steal in upon a man and lay him low at a stroke. And such is the plague in the days of its power. None can promise themselves freedom from it for an hour in any place in the infected city. It enters into a house, and men know not how. And its very breath is mortal. Yet those choice souls who dwell in God shall live above fear in the most plague-stricken places. They shall not be afraid of the plagues which walk in darkness. Famine may starve or bloody war devour Earthquake may overturn and tempest may smite. But amid all, the man who has sought the mercy seat and is sheltered beneath the wings which overshadow it shall abide in perfect peace. Days of horror and nights of terror are for other men. His days and nights are alike spent with God and therefore pass away in the sacred quiet. His peace is not a thing of times and seasons. It does not rise and set with the sun 
nor does it depend upon the healthiness of the atmosphere or the security of the country. Upon the child of the Lord's own heart, pestilence has no destroying power and calamity no wasting influence. Pestilence walks in darkness, but he dwells in the light. Destruction wastes at noonday, but upon him another sun has risen, whose beams bring restoration. Remember that voice which saith, quote, Thou shalt not fear, end quote, is that of God himself, who hereby pledges his word for the safety of those who abide under his shadow, nay, not for their own safety only, but for their serenity. So far shall they be brought from being injured that they shall not even be made to fear the ills which are around them since the Lord protects them. Brethren, he was made to be a beacon of mercy, a Christ-like, self-sacrificial expression of the living person of Jesus Christ in the midst of a ravaged, distressed, troubled, overwhelmed population of people that were terrified to die. Thus and thus is our call and our lot, beloved brethren. So I entreat you and I admonish you that you would greatly esteem the greatness of God in the midst of great tribulation and prepare your hearts to be tutored now and in the days to come that we might welcome the great tribulation as Jesus Christ embraced His cross. Embrace tribulation, brethren. Because on the other side of that doorway is the greatness of Jesus Christ. How I long to be in that generation. How I long to be accounted among that number. God make it so if it be His will.